Now let's take a look at how test and set can be used to implement a lock. We have a sequence of code up here. The idea is that you use test and set to look at the value of lock var. Test and set loads that value into a register, R1. If it's 0, then you set it to 1 right there. But if it was 1, you branch back up and test it again. Now if it was 0, you don't take the branch, but you return directly to the caller, and you are now holding the lock. Then when it comes time to unlock the lock, you use a simple ordinary store to change the value to 0 and return. Can you tell me what value does lockvar have when the lock is acquired? What value does it have when it's free? Now let's take a look at an example of test and set execution. We have thread 0 that attempts to lock and is successful. It's in the critical section. Thread 1 eventually gets in the critical section 2. So what does this show? That's my next question for you. Now we want to look at a sequence of tests and sets by three processors. Initially, no processor has a value cached. But processor P1 does a test and set and then the lock variable is cached in its cache. Since it has just modified the lock variable, it's in state M. And a bus read X transaction is used to get it, to load it into the cache. Then P2 tries to read the value of lock var, and of course, because it's a test and set, it tests and then sets it. So that's also a write reference, and it therefore also caches it in, uh, in state M that causes P1's copy to be invalidated. And the same thing happens when P3 tests it for the first time. It invalidates the copies that are held in P1's and P2's cache. Let's say that P2 happens to test it again. And then that was going to invalidate the cache copies for P1 and P3. Again, another bus read X transaction. Now finally, P1 unlocks the lock. Well, in order to do that, it's going to have to write the lock variable, so it too is going to require it in modified state, and that's going to invalidate the other two copies. The next thing that happens is that P2 tries to acquire the lock, and since it's the first to try after the unlock by P1, it gets the lock, but of course that also does a bus read X transaction and puts the block into state M. Now P3 tries to get the lock, and it doesn't succeed because P2 just got it, but again, it's another bus read X transaction and another invalidation. Let's say it tries again a little bit later. Well, it doesn't succeed this time either, but at least this time there's no invalidation because it already had the block in modified state. So P2 now unlocks the lock, and that allows P3 to acquire it the next time it does a test and set and then there's no competition for it, so the lock variable won't even be touched until P3 finally does its unlock. Now let's see how test and set did on these four metrics for performance. First of all, on uncontended latency, it doesn't do too badly, because if nobody else is contending for the lock, the processor that wants to get it simply does the lock operation. Test and set will find the value to be zero, and it's changed to one, and it doesn't have to invalidate a cache line. It immediately enters the critical section. As far as fairness is concerned, you can see that who gets the lock next is really dependent upon who's trying at the right time. P2 tried, P3 tried, P2 tried, and then P2 again. But if P3 had tried right after P1 did the unlock, it would have got it, even though P2 had been waiting slightly longer. As far as traffic is concerned, this is where test and set lock really falls down because it has to do all of these tests and all of these invalidations just to get into the critical section. I think that's about 10 of them, but you can count them just to get three processes into the critical section. And it could be worse if the loops of the processes were executed more times, then there would have been more invalidations. As far as storage is concerned, though, it's it's almost ideal because there's only a single lock variable and no other storage is used to compute who gets the critical section next. So as we've seen, the main drawback of test and set locks is the very high traffic that they cause. The many coherence transactions occur even when a lock is set as other threads or other processors are trying to get into the critical section. They don't have the lock and they have to keep trying. 
And also, the critical section may be lengthened by invalidations due to coherence transactions. So in other words, if there are variables that the critical section is using that are in the same cache block as the lock variable, every time somebody tries to get in, it's going to invalidate that line and cause another cache miss. So that may make it longer just to get through the critical section. We'd like to try to diminish the overhead. So one obvious way is to back off. Don't just keep testing it and testing it while other processes are holding it, but put in a little sleep in between tests. and That way there's not so much contention and not so many invalidations. But of course, there's no easy way to do it, to back off by the right amount. If you back off by too little, then you still have pretty high contention for the lock. But if you back off by too much, then you don't get into lock when you would have an opportunity. You keep waiting and waiting while somebody else has released lock and you could be inside the critical section, but you haven't tried yet. So you've got to back off by exactly the right amount if you want to get the best performance. And that suggests something like exponential back off. If at first you don't succeed, try again a little later and a little later and a little later and keep lengthening the interval each time. And that way you don't hit on the lock a tremendous number of times because after you hit it a few times then your retry interval is pretty long. So there are ways to improve the behavior of test and set lock but it's by no means the final word in locking and we'll look at some alternatives to it in the next few videos.